This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 91. Coming up on Space Time. Recurring Martian streaks could be just sand rather than water. New studies suggesting that cosmic dust could be transforming life between worlds. And a new plan to listen for alien signals. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims dark streaks, often seen on the slopes of Martian gullies and ravines, could be caused by moving sand rather than melting subsurface permafrost. The conclusions reported in the journal Nature Geoscience provide an alternative to previous speculation that the features, known as recurring slope lineae or RSLs, are caused by flowing meltwater from permafrost layers, seeping out from the sides of gullies and ravines. Liquid water is essential for life as we know it, so the possibility of liquid water present on Mars today has excited many in the astrobiology community. We already know that Mars was once a warm, wet world. But that was some 4 billion years ago, and since then it's lost most of its thick protective atmosphere, allowing most of the water to degas into space, in the process turning the red planet into a freeze-dry desert. The new data from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft indicates that the dark streaky features could be interpreted as granular flows, where grains of dust and sand slip downhill leaving dark streaks rather than the ground being darkened by seeping water. Continuing examination of these still perplexing seasonal dark streaks show that they only exist on slopes steep enough for dry grains to descend in the way they do on the faces of active sand dunes here on Earth. Therefore, the findings argue against the presence of enough liquid water for microbial life to thrive at these sites. However, scientists aren't yet able to explain exactly how these numerous flows begin and then gradually grow. The study's authors propose possibilities that include at least the involvement of some small amounts of water. That's indicated by the detection of hydrated salts observed at some of the flow sites. You see, the dark streaks gradually extend downhill during warm seasons when permafrost water would have had a chance to melt. They then gradually fade away during the winter, only to reappear in the next warm season. And that's the point. On Earth, only seeping water is known to behave in this way. Many thousands of these dark streaks have been identified on Mars at more than 50 separate rocky areas, ranging from the equator up to about halfway towards the poles. In other words, only on those regions on the Martian surface where it could theoretically get warm enough during summer months for water to melt. The study's lead author, Colin Dundas from the US Geological Survey, says scientists thought the dark streaks were possible liquid water flows. The problem is the slopes are more like ones one would expect to find for dry sand. The new understanding supports other evidence that shows these regions of Mars to be very dry. The data includes three-dimensional models of slope steepness, using pairs of images for stereo information. Dundas and colleagues examined some 151 dark streak features at no less than 10 separate sites. Interestingly, they found that all the streaks are restricted to slopes steeper than 27 degrees, and each of these flows seems to end on a slope that matches the dynamic angle of response, as seen on both slumping dry sand dunes on Mars and on Earth. A flow due to liquid water would readily extend to less steep angles on the slope. And that's the key. The dark streaks on Mars don't flow onto shallower slopes. In fact, the lengths of these are so closely correlated with the dynamic angle of response, it can't simply be a coincidence. The seasonal dark streaks have long been thought of as possible evidence for biologically significant liquid water, that is, sufficient water for microbial life. A granular flow explanation for the dark streaks fits with the earlier understanding that the surface of modern Mars, exposed to a cold, thin atmosphere, lacks flowing water. Any permafrost that does melt would immediately sublimate into the atmosphere. What it all means is that liquid water on today's Mars may well be limited to traces of dissolved moisture from the atmosphere and thin films, which are challenging environments for life as we know it. Still, the dark streaks do remain puzzling. That's because they do have traits that are difficult to explain. Among those problematic issues is the gradual growth of these streaks, their seasonal summertime reappearance, their rapid fading when inactive, and the presence of hydrated salts, which do have water molecules bound in their crystal structure. 
The authors of the new report have come up with some possible connections between these traits and how the dark streaks form. The salts can become hydrated by pulling water vapour out from the atmosphere, a process which can form drops of salty water. And seasonal changes in hydration of salt-containing grains could result in some trigger mechanism for dark streak grain flows, such as expansion, contraction or the release of some water. The darkening and fading of the streaks could also result from changes in hydration. However, if atmospheric water vapour really is the trigger, then the question is why the dark streaks only appear on some slopes but not others. The authors speculate that the dark streaks are probably being formed by some mechanisms that are unique to the environment of Mars. However, the bottom line's got to be that fully understanding these dark streaks is likely to depend on on-site investigations of these features. While the new report suggests that these dark streaks aren't wet enough to favour microbial life, it's still likely that any on-site investigation of these features will require special procedures to guard against introducing Earth-based microbes into the environment. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that life on Earth may have originated from biological particles brought to the planet in streams of cosmic dust. The findings, reported in the journal Astrobiology, claim fast-moving flows of interplanetary dust that continually bombard Earth's atmosphere could deliver tiny organisms from far-off worlds. Alternatively, they could also be sending Earth-based organisms to other planets. Dust streams could collide with biological particles high in Earth's atmosphere with enough energy to knock them into space. Such an event would enable bacteria and other forms of life to follow the rules of panspermia, making their way from one planet in the solar system to another, and perhaps beyond. The study's lead author, Professor Arjun Barrera from the University of Edinburgh, says the proposition that space dust collisions could propel organisms over enormous distances between planets raises some exciting prospects as to how life and the atmospheres of planets originated. Barrera says the streaming of fast space dust is found throughout planetary systems and could be a common factor in the spread of life. The findings suggest that large asteroid impacts may not be the sole mechanism by which life can be transferred between planets as was originally thought under panspermia. The researchers reached their conclusions by calculating how powerful flows of space dust, which can move at up to 70 kilometres per second, could collide with particles high in Earth's atmosphere. They found that small particles existing at 150 kilometres above Earth's surface could well be knocked beyond the limit of Earth's gravity by space dust, eventually floating onto other planets. The same mechanism could also enable the exchange of atmospheric particles between planets. The researchers point out that some bacteria, plants and even some small animals like tardigrades are known to be able to survive in space, so it's possible that such organisms, if present in Earth's upper atmosphere, could collide with fast-moving space dust particles and then withstand the journey to another world. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Way back on August 15, 1977, astronomers at Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope, supporting the SETI Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Survey, picked up a strange and very strong narrowband radio signal coming from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The mysterious signal was so unusual, astronomers drew a circle around it on a computer printout and then wrote the word WOW with an exclamation mark next to it in the margin. The computer printout was simply an alphanumeric sequence, 6EQUJ5, which represents the intensity variation of the radio signal over time. The entire signal sequence lasted for the full 72-second window during which the Big Ear was able to observe it. But it's not been detected since, despite many subsequent attempts. Two different values for the signal's frequency have been given, 1420.36 MHz and 1420.46 MHz, both very close to the 1420.41 MHz value of the hydrogen line, the electromagnetic radiation spectral line by a change in the energy state of neutral hydrogen atoms, a frequency long speculated as a possible natural signpost for any hypothetical aliens wanting to make radio contact. There have been many hypotheses to try and explain the origins of the signal, including both natural and man-made sources, but so far none of them have adequately explained the result. 
One idea involved interstellar scintillation of a weaker continuous signal, similar to atmospheric twinkling. Other hypotheses include a rotating lighthouse-like source, a signal sweeping in frequency, or a one-time burst. Of course, it could just as easily be an Earth source signal that simply got reflected up onto a piece of space debris, or it may have been a classified military signal. Earlier this year, it was suggested that a hydrogen cloud surrounding two comets, 266p Christensen and 335p Gibbs, would have been in just the right position at the time. The problem with that idea, however, is that while the hydrogen cloud would have been in the right place, the two comets won't. And it's also worth pointing out that comets usually aren't radio bright at these frequencies. To many, the WOW signal remains the strongest candidate for an alien radio transmission ever detected. But that's got to raise the question. If they are there, and if they did send a signal, why would they only do it once? There are lots of other campaigns, including SETI, still listening for intelligent alien signals. And a new campaign is now underway to listen for alien signals, not from Sagittarius, but from M31 Andromeda. The story is in the new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, which has now hit the newsstands. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. We've got a really good article about listening for signals from aliens from the Andromeda Galaxy. The Big Wow! The, galaxy, the Big Wow, the, the, yeah, the Wow signal, well, that's what they're trying to find. Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is, is, I love that you name the Andromeda Galaxy, it's just full of um, connotations from science fiction over the, over the decades, going right back a hundred years or so. All sorts of things are supposed to happen in the Andromeda Galaxy or come from the Andromeda Galaxy. In reality, it's a very long way away, and it's actually a very large galaxy. It's bigger than our galaxy. It's a similar sort of galaxy to ours. Yes, it is. It's a spiral, just like ours. Yeah, much, much bigger than the Milky Way, but it's a long way away. So this fellow decided to uh, have a listen. He actually got time on the, um, that's what astronomers call it, getting time, you know, book some time. Well, you don't book it. You apply for time on one of these telescope systems, and you, know, you, you put your application in with all sorts of other people who are trying to get time on it at the, at the same time, and uh, committees decide who's got the most work project and they give you it might be half a night or a full night or a, several days or whatever depending on the worth of your um, your program anyway he got some time on this very large array this is in America this oh this is, is in New Mexico network. yeah New Mexico this is, a, this is a very large the very large array it's called it's a, it's a network of radio dishes that can be steered to look at different angles in the sky all together sort of all, all looking at once and by having these separate dishes all spread out it gives you the effect of having one huge one bigger than you could physically build uh, so you, you, you sort of electronically combine the signals from all the small ones and that gives you effectively one large one so he listened to the Andromeda galaxy pointed it at the Andromeda galaxy and to see if he could hear any signals well he didn't hear anything as you might expect because we haven't heard it about it on the news uh, something interesting he did was first of all though to test to see whether his entire system was working and whether the radio receivers were working and everything and that it could pick up any signals if they were there he pointed it at the Voyager 1 spacecraft oh, yeah. NASA's Voyager 1 which is a long long way away now it's 130 times as far from the sun as the earth is so uh, yeah the first human made object to travel into interstellar space that's that's right I mean it's it's a long long way away in earth terms it's nowhere near the Andromeda galaxy of course but the reason he pointed his, his, the system at that and tried to pick up the signals from it is that the signals coming from it are very very faint and a very long way away and hard to spot and he, and he managed to get of course Voyager 1 so he knew that his system was working so then he pointed the telescopes at the Andromeda galaxy now if there had been any aliens there that had sent out signals of course the signals would have left the Andromeda galaxy a long long time ago in order to be reaching us now About and they would have had to years, have been, isn't it? yeah yeah well and we weren't even around two million years ago and they would have had to have incredibly strong powerful signals to be broadcasting over that depth of space something around about almost 20,000 million megawatts, which is a, an enormous sort of signal. In our terms here on Earth, I mean, we wouldn't have any, any reason to be putting out that much signal. I don't think we, we could yeah, put we out often, that much signal. We often joke about how, well, if there are aliens, they know we're about because they would have heard early episodes of I Love Lucy and, and Mr. Red and things like that. But in actual fact, that's not quite how it really works in real life. The signal's got to be very narrow, and that would have been a very broad signal that we were sending out on it. Yeah, our, our TV signals and our radar signals... Um, are quite powerful here on Earth, but further out they go in space, the more dissipated they become, yeah. and, and they get fainter and fainter. Certainly, though, if, if there were anyone nearby listening
listening to us, then they, they would spot us. But uh, the further out you get, the harder it becomes. And interestingly, when the um, square kilometre array radio telescope system is up and running in 10 or 20 years' time, it's going to be super sensitive and will be able to pick up faint signals from a very, very long way away if there are any aliens out there either intentionally or unintentionally broadcasting. So we can look forward to having that capability and it'll be interesting to see if they find anything. But for this particular uh, instance, this man I'm telling you about, the scientist who was looking at the Andromeda Galaxy, no, didn't find anything, didn't pick up any signals, but that's good because, that, you see, in science, that's good. That's an okay result because that tells you, it, it doesn't absolutely tell you there's no one out there broadcasting. It just puts a limit on what there could be if there's anything. Either there could be people out there broadcasting but not powerful enough radio transmissions to be able to be picked up by his particular electronic setup. So a negative results are perfectly fine in science. It just means that, you know, you have to go one step further if you want to listen more and more and more. It's a bit like the gravitational wave signals that they've been getting lately, right? We now have the, the super-duper gravitational wave observatories that have enough sensitivity to pick up really faint signals. But there have been gravitational wave observatories for the last 30 years or so. It's just that when they first started listening with the early ones, they weren't sensitive enough. They didn't get any results. They thought, okay, we're not getting any results, but we think there should be things out there, so we're going to have to build even more sensitive ones, which they did. Still didn't get any results. And you think, well, we're going to have to give, go one step further. So that's how it works in science. Absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. That's exactly right. And so to that end, there's going to be a new program starting soon called the Breakthrough Listen Project. This is going to be a SETI project. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they basically all amounted to listening for any signals that might be coming in from outer space. And there's $100 million going into this from a fellow called Yuri Milner, who's a, a multi-millionaire. Yeah, everyone talks about him being this great entrepreneur. He's more than an entrepreneur. He's also a physicist. So he's a real scientist. And of course, Stephen Hawking's involved in this too. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's right. So he knows what he's doing. He's got a lot of money. I can't remember how he made his money, but he's got a lot, a lot of money that he's putting into this. Um, yeah, let's not go there. Mention, yeah, let's, let's not go. We won't mention the Paradise Papers, eh? <laughs> Did you know that he's uh, been mentioned in that? Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> not, it's not to suggest that no. he's doing anything illegal no, or no, any no. of them. No, doing no, illegal, of course it's, not. But it's all, you know. Yes. Anyway, that's... Mm. So anyway, that's really interesting. So we've got a very good story about um, listening for signals from the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, speaking of hunting for things that might be out there, we also have a really good story on hunting for Planet X in our solar system. Now, when I was growing up, there was this putative thing called Planet X that people were talking about. What they were talking about You mean then Duck was... Dodgers in the 24th and a half century? That's the one. <laughs> Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century! This was uh, a putative planet out beyond Pluto when Pluto was still considered to be the ninth planet. Now, the reason that some people thought there might be a tenth planet out there was because when they, when they measured the orbit of Pluto or they watched as Pluto was trundling slowly along in its orbit and it takes 248 of our Earth years for Pluto to make one orbit of the Sun, which is one of its years, so it travels very slowly. So as they were slowly watching this planet move along, Pluto. They thought there were inaccuracies in the, in the orbit. You know, the orbit it wasn't quite going the way they expected, so they thought maybe there's another planet further out that's gravitationally tugging on it, and this was nicknamed Planet X. It turned out that wasn't the case. In fact, it was just our measurements of Pluto's orbit were a bit inaccurate, and once they got more accurate measurements, everything was fine, and there was no need then to postulate that there could be a, a Planet X out there. The world supply of Alludium Fosdex, the shaving cream atom, is alarmingly low. Now, we have reason to believe that the only remaining source is on Planet X, somewhere in this area. But zip forward a few more decades, or quite a few decades now, and there is reason to think that there might be a Planet X out there now. It would then be the ninth planet, now that Pluto's been demoted. And, of course, the irony of all that is that the guy who uh, is one of the scientists involved in the possible detection of a Planet Nine is the same guy who was behind the demotion of Pluto from planetary to dwarf planetary status. That's exactly right. So, uh, yeah, not, not an entirely um, popular move to, to poor, demote poor old Pluto. He put out a fabulous book. He, I think it was titled something like um, Why I Killed Pluto. Yes. And how, I killed, how I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. <laughs> so, so interesting story. But so anyway, the evidence now for the possible existence of a new planet X out there is that astronomers have found lots and lots and lots of small icy bodies that are orbiting the sun at huge distances way beyond Pluto. Lots and lots of them out there. There are probably millions of them out there, but they've spotted some, you know, 
fairly sizable ones, nowhere near planet size, but big enough to, to spot. And what they found was, really strangely, they all seem to have sort of similar sorts of orbits. Now, these are so far out, these bodies, that they wouldn't be affected by the gravity of all the other planets in our solar system very much at all. So you wouldn't expect them to be, you know, heavily influenced by Jupiter or Saturn or anything like that. They should just be doing their own thing out there. But these bodies that they've detected uh, and have been following are, are, have got similar sorts of orbits, so much so that it's sort of unlikely they would happen to be that like that by chance. What could explain it is that if there is a large planet a long, long way out, so far out and therefore so dim and moving so slowly that we wouldn't have spotted it so far, that could explain strange orbits of these uh, other bodies they found. So that's what they're calling Planet Epps. And this planet would be about 10 times the mass of the Earth based on the perturbations they've found in the orbits of these, I think it's 13 carbon belt objects that they're looking at. Yeah, so that's that's probably, you know, pl- uh, Neptune size or something like that. It's, mm, it's a yes, fairly large planet. So. But, but, but a long, long way out, be very dim and, and moving very slowly because the further out away from the sun you are, your orbit becomes slower and slower. I mentioned before that uh, Pluto's orbit takes 248 of our years to go around the sun. We only take one of our years to go around the sun. So the further out you get, the slower you move. So when you take pictures of all the stars, the way you spot planets and things is by seeing things. You take two pictures and see if anything's moved in between. So this would be so far out that it would be uh, would have been uh, overlooked by now, even even if we'd been pointing in the right direction with our telescopes and had images sensitive enough to pick up the faint light from something at that distance. Well, anyway, they're, they're starting to look for it. And the good thing is that um, you and I and anyone else can actually get involved. There's a thing called Zooniverse, which is one of these citizen science projects that you can get involved in. And you can get online and you can help them by looking at the pictures they're taking and see if you can spot anything moving. Uh, the more people involved, the better. So that's really something really interesting you can get involved in. Lots of citizen science projects in all sorts of sciences, but particularly astronomy as well and in fact astronomy was where the first citizen science project the online ones at least really started to take off so a really interesting thing the hunt for planet x and how you can get involved you can learn all about that in the november issue of uh, australian sky and telescope magazine now we've been talking about things a long way away we've been talking about andromeda galaxy a long way away millions of light years um, this hunt for planet x millions and millions and millions billions of kilometers from the sun We've got a really, really interesting article written by some amateur astronomers about how they went out into the desert with a whopping great, huge amateur-sized telescope. I'm talking one that's got a mirror that's 1.2 metres wide. That's about six or seven times the normal size of a backyard telescope. That's almost this professional is sort of, size, isn't it? Well, this is, the sort of, this is the size of telescope that would have been considered a professional telescope 30 years ago or mm. so. It's a whopper. And some amateurs now have these telescopes. They're quite expensive. (laughs) I certainly couldn't afford to have one, but some people do, and good on them. So these fellows went out to have one of their observing sessions uh, in the really dark skies of the desert, and they were looking to see some faint galaxies that that they'd always wanted to see, which you can which you can pick up with these giant telescopes. And so they're up there. In fact, the the telescope's so big that you have to get up on a ladder to get right to the top of it—a very large ladder. (laughs) So much so that one of the guys was saying how uh, you know, he's a bit iffy about getting up on top of this ladder, but as soon as he looked through the eyepiece of the telescope, all those fears disappeared. But the interesting thing was that while they were looking at one of these galaxies, one of them spotted some a little sort of blue dot just off to one side, and they thought, what's that? Uh, that, that looks a bit funny. So they looked it up on a star database, and it turned out to be a quasar. Oh, wow. These people had spotted with the naked eye through a telescope a quasar. Now, a quasar, which stands for quasi-stellar object, is the bright core of a very, very distant galaxy, so distant that you go back 20, 30 years ago or so, we couldn't see the rest of the galaxy that was there. You could only see this bright core, and it only just looked like a tiny pinpoint of light, like a tiny star. We are talking about objects which can be literally billions of light years away. Well, this one that they had spotted, 10 billion light years away, Stuart. Wow, that's... 10 billion light years. You're talking about (laughs) the universe being 13.8 billion years old. The light for this quasar left the supermassive black hole where it originated at the heart of this distant galaxy galaxy when the universe was less than 3.8 billion years old. 10 billion years ago, that's twice the age of the solar system, basically. We didn't even exist when the light from this quasar, and these guys were spotting it, seeing it with their own eyes through this enormous telescope. Now, this is just amazing. This light has been travelling across the universe all that time, and then going into the telescope and coming through 
the eyepiece and then hitting the retina at the back of these people's eyes. I'm amazed that it was blue. That, uh, what, is, what does that tell us, considering how much the universe is stretched in that time? Why doesn't the quasar appear red? Quasars peak in their energy output at 1,000 angstroms. For a quasar at a redshift of 1.87, this peak will shift redward to 2,870 angstroms, making it appear blue. The quasar would have to be much further away or surrounded by dust to appear red. Okay, so it's putting out its energy at a frequency that's even bluer than blue, and therefore red shifting it brings it into the blue. Quasars have to be further away to appear red. And by red shifting, we mean the expansion of the universe itself, the way the uni- space right, time yeah. itself is physically expanding. That's right. That is such a yeah. stunning piece. My mind is literally blown. Look, it's all over. It is blown everywhere. There are bits of mind I know, all but, over the place. Well, the amazing thing about this is that, that I remember when I was getting into astronomy in the 1980s, when quasars were first being spotted, really, then, and they were trying to figure out what they were. And you needed the enormous scale professional telescopes to even spot them on photographs back then. And now we've reached the stage, say, 30 years later, where amateur astronomers with 1.2 metre wide telescopes can get up on a ladder, look through the eyepiece and actually see a quasar, which is quite amazing because 30 years ago, no amateur had a 1.2 metre wide telescope. That would have just been, you know, that would have cost you half a million dollars or something. So they're much more affordable now, even though one of that size would be very expensive. So this is the amazing stuff you can do now with amateur gear, the amateur and inverted commas, just so much more capable. The telescopes, the cameras, a lot. You can do stuff now with amateur, amateur in inverted commas gear that professional professionals could only do 20 years ago. It really is remarkable and that's why there are so many amateur astronomers still. It's always been the case that amateur astronomers have been involved in scientific work alongside the professional astronomers, just as good as the professional astronomers if you like, but, but amateur in the sense of not getting paid to do it. And in this day and age there's so much tremendous technology available to the amateur astronomer that you can really do amazing scientific work. So that's a, that's a really, really interesting story. Grab hold of the, the November issue of Australian Sky and Telescope and read that. It's not technical, it's a really, really interesting story about the amazement these fellows have when they see this through the telescope. It really is. So, Stuart, also in the November issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, in fact, our cover story is a fascinating article on what's going to happen to good old planet Earth when the sun starts to swell up billions of years from now. I won't spoil the ending. You'll have to get the magazine and find out for yourself. Let's just say that it's not looking too good for us. Okay. Well, it makes me feel Put it that way. Um, I'm, I'm, fortunately, I won't be around then, but, uh, yeah. So, Stuart, lots and lots of stuff to to read and do. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. The penultimate launch of a Delta II rocket has successfully placed the first of a new generation of advanced weather satellites into orbit. The Joint Polar Satellite System 1, or JPSS-1, blasted into deep black early morning skies from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Rock, report range status. This is Rock, range is green. LC, T minus 60 second limits on. And the range operations controller reports that the range is green. T minus 45 seconds and counting. LC, launch enable to flight. Flight. ATC 3, main power disable on. On. Minus 35. Hydraulics are go. T minus, minus 30, 30 seconds. Status check. Go Delta. Go JPSS. Minus 20 seconds. Launch conductor Scott Bonney reports a green board. Everyone is go. T minus 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, engine start. 1. And liftoff of Delta 2. NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System 1, making the U.S. a more weather-ready nation. The Delta II is proceeding on a flight azimuth of 196 degrees, just to the west of 180 degrees south. Looking good. Also seeing a good symmetric burn across all six groundlet solids. We're listening to the voice of Patrick Moore, ULA flight commentator. 33 seconds into flight, the Delta II rocket will reach Mach 1, breaking the speed of sound. 30 seconds. 
chamber pressure on main engine and veneer engines continue to look good. Now passing Mach 1, Delta 2 is now supersonic. At 49 seconds, Delta and 2 continuing encounters... continuing a very symmetric burn across all six ground Maximum solid. aerodynamic pressure, or Max-Q. This is the point where the mechanical stress in the rocket now reaches its peak. Now passing 48 seconds, Max-Q, maximum dynamic pressure. The six ground-lit solid rocket motors will burn out about 64 seconds into flight. Tail off. The three air-lit motors will ignite a second and a half later. And we have burnout and ignition of the three air-lit solids. Approaching the de- jettison of the Delta Delta two graphite epoxy solid rocket good. motors in Gas three sequences of three. The first three will fall away one minute, 26 seconds into flight, followed a second later by the next three. Now one minute, 25 seconds into flight, and we have good jettison of all six groundlet solids. The final three air lid motors will continue to burn until they are jettisoned two minutes, 11 seconds into flight. Chamber pressure on the main engine, both veneer engines continuing to remain very stable. Gas generator fuel and locks injector pressure is also looking very good. And we're standing by for the jettison of the final three solid rocket motors. The chamber pressure is on the airlit solids tailing off in preparation for burnout. And we have burnout of the airlit solids and good jettison of all three airlit solids. And the booster LOX tank press valve has been open. LOX tank ohlage pressure response looks good. Two minutes, 30 seconds into the flight of Delta. And main engine and veneer engine chamber pressures continue to remain very stable. Once again, listening to Patrick Moore, United Launch Alliance flight commentator. Now two minutes, 50 seconds into flight, now passing Mach 10. The next major milestone is main engine cutoff, or MECO. The first stage, RS-27A main engine. And will three cut minutes off. into flight. Engine operating parameters on main engine and both veneer engines continue to look good. Miko is scheduled for four minutes, 20 seconds after liftoff. And it's 20 seconds into flight. Just one minute remaining now until main engine cutoff. And vehicle body rates have smoothed out nicely now as the vehicle continues to climb through the upper atmosphere. Nine seconds after Miko, we'll have separation of the first and second stages of the Delta. Main engine chamber pressure looks good. Both veneer engine chamber pressures continue to look good. Gas generator fuel and locks injector pressures remain very stable. Uh, Vehicle body rate's also looking very good. Now at four minutes into flight, about 20 seconds remaining until main engine cutoff. Uh, Following main engine cutoff, the veneer engines will continue to burn for a few additional seconds to maintain attitude control uh, leading up to stage separation. Standing by for main engine cutoff momentarily. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff, and Vico, veneer engine cutoff. And we have good indication of stage separation, standing by for stage two ignition. The first and second stage, the Delta II have separated. Stage chamber pressure looks good. And ignition of the second stage. And we have a good indication of fairing jettison. And vehicle body rates have smoothed out nicely from the staging events. Now four minutes, 50 seconds into flight. The first burn of the second stage will last just under six minutes. The payload fairing that protected NOAA's JPSS-1 during its dynamic flight through the atmosphere has been jettisoned, exposing JPSS-1 to space for the first time. This first burn of four for the second second stage on Delta II will position NOAA's JPSS-1 in its correct orbit. The third burn will position a series of CubeSats in their proper orbit. And the fourth burn will be a disposal burn of the Delta II second stage. All of these burns happening over the next hour and 45 minutes. Now passing five minutes, 30 seconds into flight. About five minutes remaining in the first burn of the second stage. Vehicle body rate continue to remain very smooth. Chamber pressure on the second stage. Engine looks good. Hydraulic system pressure on the second stage also looking good. Fuel and oxidizer feed line pressures remain very stable in uh, nominal values. Six minutes now into passing flight. Six minutes into flight. Listening to Patrick Moore, ULA flight commentator. And now passing six minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Four minutes remaining until engine cutoff. Second stage engine continues to perform well. Chamber pressure remains very stable. Fuel and oxidizer feed line pressures also remain very stable within family. Hydraulic system pressure also remaining stable. And seeing a a nice decay profile on the helium bottle pressure, as expected. Recapping where we are. The Delta II rocket launched at 1.47.36 a.m. Pacific Time, carrying the Joint Polar Satellite System 1 inside a payload fairing atop of the rocket. The Delta II first and second stage engine with nine solid now rocket motors. Seven minutes, 30 seconds into flight. And the Delta second stage had performed well. Rates uh, remaining very smooth, uh, close to zero on roll pitch and yaw body rates. Second stage engine continues to perform well. Chamber pressures and fuel and oxidizer, oxidizer feed line pressures continue to look good. Now eight minutes into flight. Coming up on two minutes till second stage engine cutoff number one. 
at 10 minutes, 30 seconds after launch. And just under two minutes remaining now in the first burn of the second stage. Nine minutes into flight, NOAA's JPSS-1 satellite atop the Delta II second stage. Now just over one minute remaining in the first burn. Second stage engine continues to perform well. Chamber pressure well within expected values. Fuel and oxidizer feed line pressures also remain very stable. Hydraulic system pressure uh, within the expected range. Now just over one minute remaining in the first burn. Second stage engine continues to perform well. Chamber pressure well within expected values. Fuel and oxidizer feed line pressures also remain very stable. Hydraulic system pressure uh, within the expected range. And body rates continue to remain very smooth, uh, close to null for all body rates. About 30 now seconds 30 away seconds from remaining second stage cutoff. engine cutoff. And standing by for SECO 1 in approximately 8 seconds. And we have engine cutoff. Vehicle body rate response is damping out nicely from the cutoff event. And as you hear from Patrick Moore from United Launch Alliance, SECO-1 is confirmed, beginning a coast phase of just over 40 minutes. The engine will reignite at about 2.38 a.m. Pacific time, 50 minutes, 47 seconds into flight. The 2,540-kilogram spacecraft is the first in a series of four new weather satellites equipped with next-generation technology designed to improve the accuracy of U.S. weather forecasts out to seven days. The new constellation will be operated by NASA and NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, which operates America's National Weather Service. Approximately 63 minutes after launch, the solar arrays on JPSS-1 were deployed and the spacecraft began operating under its own power. JPSS-1 will be renamed NOAA-20 once it reaches its final sun-synchronous orbit. Following a three-month checkout and validation of its five onboard science instruments, the satellite will become fully operational. JPSS-1 will join Tsunomi, the National Polar Orbiting Partnership satellite, which is also jointly operated by NOAA and NASA. It's already in the same orbit, providing meteorologists with observations of atmospheric temperature and moisture, cloud cover, sea surface temperature, ocean colour, sea ice cover, volcanic ash and fire detection. The JPSS-1 data will improve weather forecasting, providing better predictions of storm tracks, thereby allowing emergency services in danger zones to be better prepared. As well as the primary payload, five CubeSats were also sent up and deployed on the mission. The CubeSats range from technology demonstrators to school student experiments. The mission also marked the second last launch of a Boeing Delta II rocket. After some three decades of flight, the historic final Delta II launch will blast off next year, carrying NASA's ISAT-2 satellite. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency has launched a MAX's sounding rocket to see how microgravity affects microorganisms. The mission, which blasted off from Sweden's Estrange Space Centre, flew on a suborbital ballistic trajectory, delivering its five onboard experiments to the very edge of space. The scientific payload was then jettisoned, experiencing 12 minutes of microgravity during its freefall back to Earth before parachutes deployed to soften the landing. The experiment modules were then recovered and returned back to the launch site by helicopter. The MAX's payload comprised some 600 kilograms of scientific experiments. The primary experiment looked at cellular biology, seeing how free-swimming unicellular microorganisms reacted to different levels of gravitational force. This allowed the scientists to determine when microorganisms began to perceive the difference between up and down. Another experiment examined metal dust combustion in microgravity. The experiment observed how a flame propagates through a suspension of iron particles in a gas. Scientists found the suspension remained stable in microgravity, with the flame remaining undisrupted. The findings could help researchers developing future iron combustion energy systems designed not to produce any greenhouse gas emissions. A third experiment studied solidification physics. It examined how four samples of pre-molten lightweight alloys solidified under different conditions. The alloys would be used in making new generation jet engine turbine blades. And testing their solidification will help improve turbine blade production. Other experiments looked at thermophysical properties measurements and aerodynamics. This was the 10th flight for the 15.5 metre tall Max's sounding rocket. The solid fueled rocket launch vehicle is a joint venture between the Swedish Space Corporation and Airbus. It's designed to provide the European Space Agency with access to a free-fall test platform for microgravity experiments. 
The 12,400 kilogram Maxis rocket can carry up to 800 kilograms on ballistic suborbital trajectories to altitudes of 700 kilometres, thereby providing up to 14 minutes of microgravity for experimental payloads. The experiments are all mounted in reusable modules designed to allow the transmission of real-time data back to ground stations on exactly how the experiments are performing. This in turn allows researchers to follow results in real time and adjust the experiment's parameters during flight. Being able to launch, monitor and then retrieve experiments all in the one day means researchers can almost immediately analyse their results, something not possible with experiments sent to the International Space Station. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. And scientists have developed special patches designed to help people with peanut allergies. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association claims the new wearable patches, which are designed to help people become less sensitive to peanuts, are already showing promise in early trials. The patches are designed to give patients continual exposure to controlled amounts of peanut proteins while at the same time not posing the risk of triggering the allergy that actually eating peanuts would. The trial uses patches with low, intermediate and high doses of peanut protein. Compared to the placebo, those given the high-dose patches were less likely to react even when given more peanut protein to eat. A new study warns that women who are overweight or underweight before pregnancy were more likely to suffer life-threatening childbirth complications compared to healthy weight women. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on a study of 750,000 women. Researchers found that conditions such as sepsis or acute kidney failure were more common among women who reported high or low body mass index before contraception. The authors also found that the numbers rose as body mass index either increased or decreased. Researchers stress, however, that the increases in risk were still very small and their study couldn't show a cause and effect. A new study has found that just like humans, budgerigars can regulate their evaporative water loss, the water they lose through their skin. The findings, reported in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, are based on a study of seven budgies in outdoor aviaries subjected to variations in temperature and humidity. Their evaporative water loss remained constant despite changes in conditions. Scientists say controlling water loss might help the small Australian desert birds regulate their body temperature so they can better survive in the hot outback conditions where water resources are likely to be scarce. NASA has detected a geothermal heat source known as a mantle plume deep below Antarctica's Murray Birdland. The discovery, reported in the Journal of Geophysical Research, helps explain some of the melting that creates lakes and rivers under the Antarctic ice sheet. Understanding both the sources and future of meltwater under the West Antarctic ice sheet is important for estimating the rate at which ice could be lost to the ocean in the future because of man-made global warming. Antarctica's bedrocks laced with rivers and lakes, the largest of which are as big as Lake Erie. Many of these lakes fill and drain rapidly, forcing the ice surface thousands of feet above them to rise and fall by as much as 6 metres. Some 30 years ago, scientists suggested heat from a mantle plume deep under Murray Birdland might explain regional volcanic activity and a topographic dome feature. And the recent study has now supported this hypothesis. To reach their conclusions, scientists used computer modelling combined with data from NASA's ISAT satellite, seismic imaging and airborne surveys from NASA's IceBridge campaign. They found that the flux of energy from a mantle plume would be no more than 150 milliwatts per square metre. By comparison, areas with no volcanic activity still receive between 40 and 60 milliwatts per square metre of heat flux from the underlying mantle. Meanwhile, places like Yellowstone National Park, a well-known geothermal hotspot, gets around 200 milliwatts per square metre averaged over the entire park. Although, of course, there are individual geothermal features such as geysers which are much hotter. The seismic imaging shows that the mantle heat in this part of Antarctica appears to be coming through a fracture in the Earth's crust, which appears to be very similar to Africa's Great Rift Valley. And finally for now, health experts are urging state and federal governments to consider suing tobacco companies in order to recover the costs to the public health system from smoking-related illness. A report in the Medical Journal of Australia says Canberra could follow the lead of Canada where their first health care cost recovery lawsuit was filed in 1998, 
and upheld by the Supreme Court as a constitutional right. The call follows a new study by the Oklahoma Tobacco Research Center at the Stevenson Cancer Institute, which found that many people are still unaware of the court findings against big tobacco companies. Shortly, major tobacco companies, including Altera, Philip Morris USA and R.J. Reynolds, to name just a few, will begin publishing court-ordered corrective statements about cigarettes, the results of a 2006 U.S. federal court verdict that found tobacco companies in violation of the racketeer-influenced and corrupt organizations legislation, better known as the RICO Act. The five court-ordered statements address 18 facts about tobacco companies' manipulation of nicotine levels, low tar or light cigarettes being just as harmful as regular cigarettes, nicotine addiction, the deadly health effects of smoking, and the health effects of secondhand smoke. Researchers found that only 36.5% of people were aware that more people die each year from smoking than from murder, AIDS, suicide, drugs, car crashes and alcohol combined. Only 42.1% knew that smoking kills on average 1,200 Americans every day. Only 45.5% were aware that low-tar or light cigarette smokers inhale essentially the same amount of tar and nicotine as they would from regular cigarettes. Only 47% knew that cigarette companies control the impact and delivery of nicotine by designing filters and selecting cigarette papers to maximise the ingestion of nicotine, adding ammonia to make the cigarettes taste less harsh and controlling both the physical and chemical makeup of the tobacco blend. Only 47.1% of people knew that second-hand cigarette smoke kills more than 38,000 Americans each year. And only 47.4% knew that Altera, RJ Reynolds Tobacco, Lorillard and Philip Morris USA intentionally designed cigarettes to make them more addictive. Of the 10 major court findings surveyed, less than half of people said they were aware that the cigarette companies had violated civil racketeering laws. Most of those surveyed were also unaware that tobacco companies had denied that they had controlled the level of nicotine in order to create and sustain addiction or that they had marketed low-tar and light cigarettes as less harmful, even though they very well knew they weren't less harmful. And most people didn't know that the tobacco companies suppressed and concealed scientific research. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 